It is truly a privilege to introduce our next presenter. Based out of Baskin Ridge, New Jersey, Caladrius Biosciences, ticker CLBS on the NASDAQ, is dedicated to the development of cellular therapies designed to reverse disease. The company's current product candidates include CLBS 16, which is for the treatment of coronary microvascular dysfunction, or CMD, CLBS 12, which targets Berger's disease in the US, as well as CLBS 201, designed to assess the safety and efficacy of CD34 plus cell therapy as a treatment for diabetic kidney disease. Caladrius has participated in our conferences over the years, and I had the utmost pleasure of spending a day with management, mostly stuck in Bay Area traffic and discussing my fast food eating habits. The only thing I really concluded from the trip is that Jack in the Box is probably not good for your overall health, and the management team here takes incredible pride in what they do each and every day. Joining us on the call today, it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome the president and CEO of Caladrius, Mr. David Mazzo, or in this case, Dr. Mazzo. David, just seeing your face lightens me up. Um, it is, it's, I'm so happy that you're here, and, and thank you again for presenting Caladrius to our audience. The floor is now yours. Well, Chris, thank you. Thank you so much. And, and I appreciate those kind words in the introduction. Um, we did have an enjoyable day, even, even if there was a bit of traffic, but uh, it, was, it was great to have an opportunity to discuss a lot of our programs in greater depth. And I'm really pleased to be here. I'm looking forward to the day when we can all do these kinds of things in person again, hopefully before the end of this calendar year. And as you mentioned, we are here to talk about Caladrius, where we are developing regenerative therapies that are targeted at reversing chronic diseases. Chris mentioned we're a public company, so I'll just remind everyone that I will be making some forward-looking statements in this brief summary of Caladrius. So let's start with sort of an overall look at why Caladrius might be interesting to investors today. We believe that Caladrius is one of those rare companies that has solid human clinical data, a strong management team, a stable balance sheet, and yet has not fully been recognized by the market for its complete value. So we believe there's quite a lot of upside in our stock and in our programs going over the next couple of years. We specialize in CD34 positive cell therapy. We have a platform technology that's yielded a multi-product development pipeline. And a number of our programs have received the regenerative medicine breakthrough generation uh, designation equivalent in the jurisdictions where they're being developed. We have a strong intellectual property portfolio and proprietary field leading technology. We're working only in those indications where there is little or no competition uh, and very high unmet medical need. Importantly for investors, we have multiple potential value creating events over the next couple of years. And as I mentioned earlier, we have a strong balance sheet, even with the number of clinical programs that we have currently ongoing. We have over $100 million in cash with no debt and a cash runway that's projected to fund our operations for you know, several years to come. And then finally, we do have a seasoned management team with noteworthy domain experience from both big pharma and the emerging biotech industry. Our CD34 cell, th cell therapy technology is actually very well characterized. It has been studied extensively preclinically and clinically. And very simply, our cells promote the growth of new microvasculature. They are naturally occurring endothelial progenitors, and they possess pre-programmed pro-angiogenic and anti-inflammatory tissue repair properties. And so while they're not clot busters, if you will, what they do is they create the equivalent of a biological bypass in those tissues where there are ischemic compromises, and they do allow for the formation of new capillaries and the reperfusion of compromised tissues. The, th the therapy has been studied extensively and has been clinically validated across a variety of ischemic diseases. We now have results from more than 1,000 patients across a wide variety of rigorous clinical studies that have demonstrated the consistent and compelling results that show that a single treatment elicits a durable therapeutic effect and that we've never reported a cell-related adverse event. Our manufacturing process is rapid, it's economical, and it's already scaled to meet phase three and early commercial projections. It is four days of 
pretreatment with GCSF to mobilize CD34 cells from the bone marrow into the peripheral circulation of the donor, who is also the patient, and then an apheresis process to collect a sample of those monocytes, which is then sent to a central processing facility where the cells are isolated, concentrated, and formulated containing CD34 positive, CX, CR4 positive cells, which is then sent back to the site where the donation was given and returned to the patient uh, through an infusion or injection, depending upon the disease being treated. There's no genetic manipulation, no ex vivo expansion. And as you can see from the slide, it's four days from vein to vein. So very concentrated uh, and focused period of time. We've already mentioned our IP portfolio. What's important to note is that unlike many cell therapies, we actually have patents granted for our non-expanded cells, and they provide us with the equivalent of pharmaceutical composition of matter protection. Uh, they protect the therapeutic concentration range, the stabilizing serum, the, the use as a repair mechanism for vac vascular insufficiency, and as I mentioned, also pharmaceutical composition. And then we have used that cell platform to create what we believe is a, a quite interesting mid to late stage clinical development pipeline, including all of the compounds that Chris has already mentioned. I will not have enough time to go into these in any great depth, but let's start with CLBS-16, just to give you a little bit more information. Uh, CLBS-16 reported the results from a very positive phase 2A trial uh, early in 2020 that was called the ESCAPE. CMD trial, where we demonstrated statistically that patients can see an improvement in their coronary flow reserve, which is a physiologic measurement of the microvasculature of the heart or heart perfusion, as well as statistical reduction in angina frequency and an improvement in the Seattle Angina Questionnaire scores. That's lead, led us now to the FREEDOM trial, which is a randomized phase 2A trial, phase 2B trial which is ongoing here in the United States and, and for which we expect to have data uh, next year. Uh, we've already spoken about uh, Honedra or CLBS-12. That's Sakagaki designated in Japan, which is a sort of regulatory breakthrough status. It's being studied in CLI, critical limb ischemia and Berger's disease there. And we have an orphan designation for Berger's disease here in the United States. Honedra is just a couple of patients away from completing enrollment in their registration eligible trial for that combination indication. And the only reason why that trial isn't completed now is that Japan has been under a state of emergency due to the COVID-19 pandemic now since February of 2020. It continues now and likely will continue through the summer. And during that period of time, it's almost impossible to enroll patients in clinical trials, which require uh, the use of hospital facilities. And then finally, we'll mention CLBS-201, our newest program, very excited about moving into diabetic kidney disease. Our phase two proof of concept study is likely to start uh, this fall, and we're looking for data from that trial sometime in, during the course of uh, next year and into 2023. So overall, we have a number of very interesting data generated or regulatory generated milestones from 2021 through 2022. They're laid out here. And of course, you can find much more detail on all of these in our corporate presentation, which is available on our website at www.caladrius.com. Anything with a green check has already been achieved for the course of this year. And as you can see over the course of the next several months, a number of important milestones should be achieved, including completion of enrollment in the Honedra trial in Japan, initiation of the CLBS-201 trial, and uh, market progression of enrollment in the Freedom trial. Uh, just a brief word about finances. As I mentioned, we have a balance sheet which has over $100 million in, in cash. The exact number I won't quote right now, but you'll see it in the 10Q, which we filed a week from uh, tomorrow. And uh, you can also see we have no debt, a very clean uh, capital sheet, and, uh, and really enough cash to run our business going out for multiple years. So really a very solid financial situation. So that brings us, Chris, back to the summary where we started. I won't repeat this, but again, I'll emphasize that we believe that Caladrius is, in fact, a very interesting uh, investment opportunity with the potential for tremendous upside data on the horizon, 
and um, and really a strong financial situation. And I look forward to having a conversation with you about the company, its projects, and any other questions you might have about watches or a jack in the box. So <laughs> talk. Uh, let's let's go ahead and have that LD, conversation. LD is the only place where you could talk about Burger's disease and the two talking special. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So. <laughs> so look, it's, uh, I thank you for the presentation portion. Um, for anyone that has any questions, you can do it two ways. You can use the Q&A app in Zoom, or you can email me um, privately at chris at ldmicro.com. And we already have uh, a few questions. So whenever you are ready, let me know and I'll go through them. Good to go. <laughs> David, do you have a timeline on when you guys will get phase two data for CLBS 12? 16 and 201. We do. So, and, and, and unfortunately, that timeline can't be as precise as I would have been in the past, like everyone else, because there's a certain degree of unpredictability due to COVID. So our CLBS 16 program, the, fa the phase 2B freedom trial, is currently projected to complete enrollment in the spring of 2022 and to have data by the end of 2022 or early 2023. Now that's influenced to a great extent by COVID because that program requires hospitalization for the procedures, right? It's a catheterization and an injection, an intracoronary injection. And as hospitals allocate more and more resources to the Delta variant and emerging COVID cases, there's less and less room for clinical trials. So. We don't know how that impact is going to be felt over the course of the next several months, but the data that I just gave you from the dates are, are what we're standing by now. For CLBS 201, it's sort of the same situation. Those are intra-arterial injections into the renal arteries. It's done, these are all outpatient, but you still need to be in the hospital for a day. So we don't know whether COVID is gonna have an impact on that. Right now, we're planning to initiate enrollment in the fall of this year. There's a six patient run-in arm, open label run-in arm, which will be about a month per patient. So if we can start in early fall by sometime at the, you know, the late first quarter, early second quarter of next year, we'll have the results of that run-in trial, which will allow us to then move into the 40 patient randomized portion of that, which is expected to take about a year to enroll. So we're looking at you know, 2023 for enrollment and data. And then for Hanedra, that is actually a registration eligible trial. So I wouldn't characterize it as phase two. It's, it's more akin to a phase three trial in Japan. And we are only you know, single digit numbers away from completing enrollment. Soon as that state of emergency is lifted, which I hope will happen when the Olympics are over, we should be able to complete enrollment then hopefully by the end of this year and be in a position to have data next year. And I'm curious, I think I already know the answer, but are you an Olympics fan like I am? I am. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I should not have been watching uh, ping pong men's semifinals <laughs> at three in the morning, but it was just so good. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's possible that humans have that good hand eye coordination. Uh, it's, go, please. No, I was going to say, I, 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 completely, uh, I completely agree. If anybody's ever tried to play you know, competitive ping pong or maybe even racquetball or high ally or any of those other sports where the ball is moving at that speed, you, you realize the danger of, of not being able to move your arms as quickly as your eyes could see. You bet. And just for full disclosure, if I yawn on this call, it is not because of David's presentation. It's because of my lack of sleep from this morning. So I just want to give that. The next question, and I always love Yankees references, but, <laughs> um, you know, um, Tom, thank you for the question. It seems like you guys have the murderer's row uh, in your scientific uh, scientific advisory board. Can you tell us what role these doctors play for Caladrius on a monthly and quarterly basis? Great question. Uh, and thank you again. Yeah, great question. And thanks for the recognition. We really do have the who's who. And you know, I I lovingly refer to them as the cardiovascular mafia. I mean, these these are these are the folks who really control. The, the, the practice of cardiovascular medicine in many respects throughout the United States, if not the world. They are involved uh, intimately in, in our programs. Not only are they on the advisory board, many of them are operating clinical sites, which enroll patients in our trials. They are advocates for our technology. They speak with us to the FDA and other regulatory agencies when necessary. Uh, they help define protocol and protocol amendments. 
and they also help with data uh, interpretation. In some cases, those who are not directly involved in the trials sit on our data safety monitoring boards. So they are an integral part of the Caladris team. We are really beholden to them and depend very heavily on their expertise. Yeah, I got to say, I mean, <laughs> if anyone has a little bit of time to kind of kind of look at this as group, I mean, have these are these friendships of yours and the company over the years? Is it something that happened when you joined? I mean, what's kind of the dynamic of your relationship? So, the, so the, the dynamic comes from from several uh, several places. First, you know, for those who've looked at my history, I've been working in the cardiovascular area for quite some time. And so many of these folks are people that I have been interacting with and, and utilizing as consultants and advisors for going on two decades, uh, even back to sometimes uh, my big pharma you know, uh, days. Um, our, our previous chief medical officer, who was a cardiologist and, and, and had spent much of his career in academics, uh, knew these many of these people as well. And those that uh, I didn't know, he introduced me to, and those that he didn't know, I introduced him to. So that was really a symbiotic uh, relationship. And then, uh, you know, we've just forged a couple of new relationships simply on the quality of the data that we've had and the need to reach out to additional people who are treating patients in live time and who can offer us sort of a real world vision of what our trials should, should try to accomplish. So you, 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 I've probably told you this over the years, but this is pretty much how every Lahiji and Andalibi dies. Okay? <laughs> it, it's, I mean, yeah. it, it's literally, and my dad, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, have known him over time. Mm -hmm. My dad was probably the first person in our household to survive his first heart attack, yeah. which is not exactly something that anyone wants to be proud of. Um, so kind of tell us what, how big these target markets are for you guys. <laughs> um, because I feel that people tend to kind of overlook how big the coronary market is. And sadly, it's also growing exponentially because again, of a lot of reasons that I don't right. have time to discuss, but how, how do you kind of, how do you kind of see the world evolving in this space and where do you feel your niche is going to showcase itself? So we've, we've taken sort of a, a a bifurcated approach. Some of our indications uh, are focused on, you know, orphan sized populations that are very uh, severely, you know, in need of, of, of medical treatment, but for whom exists nothing today. So that would be like the burgers population or our no option refractory disabling angina population, where the numbers are relatively small, but the need is extraordinarily disproportionately, disproportionately high. But the FREEDOM trial in coronary microvascular dysfunction is the polar opposite of that. CMD, most people haven't heard of CMD. And I actually will take this moment to put in a, you know, a plug for our, our, um, our collaborators and colleagues at the American Heart Association. We are running a, um, a collaborative venture with them over the course of the, the summer and, and the last several months to help increase the awareness of CMD, just generally speaking. So it's not really a commercial for Caladrius as much as a, a, an awareness campaign, an educational campaign to get people to understand what CMD is. And there, there are literally millions of people in the United States suffering from CMD. And many of them don't realize that's what it is. In fact, you'll see on the AHA website, there's a couple of uh, patient, um, I'll call them profiles, where the typical patient experience prior to official diagnosis of CMD is to be told it's all in your head. That's not real pain. It's you're having an anxiety attack or that shortness of breath. Oh, you must have, you know, uh, just overexerted yourself once or something. When, when they get to a cardiologist who actually knows about the disease and does the appropriate diagnostic tests, which are, are available now readily, and says, you have insufficient microvasculature in your heart. Now we have a possible, possible treatment. So there, the market is enormous. It's, it could be as many as a million and a half patients in the US alone. And then with diabetic kidney disease, sorry to, to just oh, no. end on that note, um, we are focusing initially on people with stage 3B and maybe eventually stage 4 kidney disease. But again, with the increase in obesity, type 2 diabetes, an aging population, a more sedentary population, stress from COVID, COVID itself, the amount of uh, kidney disease is increasing tremendously throughout the world. So again, an enormous unmet medical need. And I was going to add to what uh, 
David said, if you guys want to know what the overall health of the average American person is, just go to a theme park this summer. <laughs> Trust me, it, you're not going to like what you see. You know, it's like, I, I'm telling you, and, and you know this, David, you saw me at 300 pounds and you've seen me at 204. You can't get grilled chicken at Disneyland. I just want to tell you that. It's almost the answer impossible. Right. <laughs> There was a question in regards to CMD as to why it disproportionately uh, affects women. Is it mostly anatomical or it's something else that nobody knows as of yet? If, if anyone knows, it hasn't been published yet. We certainly don't know why. It's a clear and established empirical fact. It's about two thirds to three quarters more prevalent in females than males, but it's not purely a female disease. And, and we're not really sure why. It also tends to show up in females uh, in their premenopausal years. So it t tends to affect younger people as well. I don't know if it's associated with childbirth. There just really hasn't been a strong epidemiological study to understand that. There's probably a genetic component as well. So based off your history with several large pharma companies, based off what you do every day, mm -hmm. can you tell everyone what's kind of your, you know, your one or two tips for healthy kidneys and healthy hearts that you ultimately partake in? Well, this is going to sound so cliche, but it's going to be, you know, eat right, Ugh. exercise, you know, and, and I will be, you know, many of you who do know me, know my history. We lived in, in France for a long time and I did my postdoctoral work in, in Switzerland. So, and we're first generation, you know, Italian uh, immigrant family. So, you know, we, we live a Mediterranean lifestyle when it comes to diet, which really means everything available, but in moderation. It's the hardest thing to do, but that's really what it comes down to. <laughs> I promise I'll never ask that question to you again. Okay? <laughs> but, no, but, but you know, it's 100% right. Because, because there's no way in hell you're going to prevent yourself from eating all the things that you love. Right. If you have just a little bit, it, it truly kind of moves the puck forward. And I got to tell you, the food in France, I don't know what they do. It is, uh, in my opinion, it's the best food in the world that I've ever had personally. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's a culinary delight there. And, and I can't, you know, fault the feud in my, you know, my, my former homeland, if you will, in, in Italy as well. But that, that whole portion of the world, it's because the food is mostly fresh, unprocessed, and, uh, you know, and ripe when it's served. So that's, yeah. that's the difference. <laughs> So now, of course, I've been buttering you up for the last 15 minutes. Now I'm going to ask the really hard questions. Okay. Yes. So there's a question from our Q&A. Why does management believe that the company is trading below current cash mm -hmm. and getting no value for your trials? Remember, David, I didn't ask this. This guy that's did. A, that's okay. So, it's it's, so, so it's the 64000 or maybe $64 million question because right. by any reasonable comps, we should be trading at 10 you know, times our, our current market cap. But the problem is, is we believe, and of course nobody knows this, but we believe the problem is multifaceted. We believe that it's the area in which we're working, which is cardiovascular medicine generally. Most people see cardiovascular medicine as requiring enormous mega trials and taking a long time and very, very large sums of money to get to registration. It's cell therapy where unfortunately, uh, at least historically, there was a lot of um, bad medicine done, premature announcements of success and so on that have made people really skeptical about, about cell therapy. And then I think it also encompasses the fact that people are looking for what I would call the, you know, the, the quick fix. And the quick fix is easier to identify in the area of oncology. So a lot of money flows into oncology. A lot of people are more interested in cancer. Uh, it's saying sexier in that context is not right, but, but, you know, it's more attractive to investors in that sense. And so we believe we're in the show me field of biopharmaceutical, you know, for those of you who know a little bit of theology, you know, we're the sort of the, the St. Thomas of the biotech world. They want to see the data generated by us. And that's why we're putting so much weight in the freedom trial, especially because that is randomized placebo controlled, you know, large number of people. I mean, with the endpoints that the FDA has agreed would be pivotal for a phase three trial. This is not a registration trial, but it will be definitive in proving, we believe, that our cell therapy works. And of course, the data coming out of Japan so far has been very positive and getting Honedra or CLBS-12 approved in Japan will go a long way in that direction as well. So 
we think we're on the precipice of seeing that value recognition, and it should come over the next couple of years, but we do believe it's going to be based on data. Uh, David, I'm just going to make a, you know, a plug right now for anyone who's on ldmicro.com. I don't think it's a bad idea to look at a two-year and five-year chart of Caladrius, because what I want to mention to you, David, is that you know, as someone who follows the company closely like I do, we have huge surges where it's like, it's finally our time. We've made it only to be followed by just kind of this steady decline right. that is sad and illiquid and it kind of goes back. I mean, and I know that it has to frustrate you guys because I don't think it's a zero sum game. Right. I mean, how do you, how do you keep management optimistic, positive? Cause, cause now as a public company executive, when tracks is down, I feel like crap. Yeah. And, you know, I would always tell you like advice is don't look at the stock, you know, it's not important, but how do you, how do you keep high morale? What, how do you interpret what the street is looking at? Because when good news comes out, the stock rips on tens of millions of shares right. and you guys are literally on the streamer on CNBC, but then it's followed by long periods, long periods of just inactivity. Right, the doldrums, right? And, yeah. and, that's, and I think that you know, the way we do it is multifaceted again. So the easiest thing to do is first of all, you know, we all believe viscerally that these cells do what they say that they're going to do and they're going to provide a solution for patients that will be pharmacoeconomically attractive and medically viable. And so you know, that's where you have to start. So we have, a, we have a group of people that believes. And so what the outside world believes at the moment is less important. Um, not unimportant, but just less important. Uh, then, you know, we're a small company and, and we stay small. We're very capital efficient. And so another way to keep people from staring at the stock and getting demoralized is to keep them so busy they don't have any time to stare at the stock. And that's what we, and that's what we are. So with 28 people, we're running three clinical programs, one of them internationally. We're, we're filing, you know, INDs. We're getting prepared for meetings with FDA, EMA, PA, PDMA, et cetera. And, and because we were so fortunate in raising money, which, by the way, is an indication that there are people out there who see value in us in the long term, we have now excess capital, if you will. By that, I mean capital not immediately dedicated to our ongoing programs that allows us to, to look for ways to expand the pipeline and, and diversify a little bit. So it's an exciting time within Caladris. We've got uh, you know, many, many dedicated and, uh, and focused people. And, you know, we're not happy that the stock languages, as you said, but, you know, even Christopher Columbus, when he was, you know, coming across the oceans for the first time, sat for several months in the doldrums before he caught a wind and got to North America. So, and so we have three questions. This one's from Tom. Uh, Tom, thank you for the question. Any update on the FDA discussions regarding uh, OLOGO, a yeah. logo, CLBS 16? Is there an expected timeline when those discussions will be completed? So um, there is an update. The update, uh, which we've already announced uh, in a previous quarterly conference call, and we'll get to in more detail later, that update is that that um, CBER, and, and here's a little bit of, uh, I, I'm sorry, this is a little bit long-winded, but it's really important for everyone to understand the perspective here. We're working in cardiovascular medicine, where the expertise at FDA resides in the cardiorenal division which is part of CEDAR, the Center for Drugs. But because we're a biologic, all of our reviews and discussions are centered at CBER, the Center for Biologics, where the expertise in cardiovascular medicine is, is um, less. Um, we have been asked by CBER to perform a 400 patient phase three trial in the oligo population, which is this orphaned sized uh, Norda population, um, with 150 of those patients being on placebo and 50 on them being a standard of care, which means roughly half of the patients will get nothing that will work for the duration of the trial, which could last several years. So given the size of that in relation to the population and that particular fact, we have been working with FDA to convince them that a smaller trial uh, and perhaps even an open label trial is really the only practical way to move this forward. And so far, they have been reticent to see the world through our eyes. And so um, until we are able to get them to move off of that, what we believe impractical and unrealistic requirement, we can't move forward. 
Uh, it's, it's also a function of dollars and cents. That's a $75 million trial. But it's, it's, it's just simply the fact that it, it probably can't be enrolled the way it's designed. And, and we continue to work on that. So we have not given up on the discussions, but we've been at this for some time now, and FDA has been uh, immovable on their position so far. David, there's two more questions coming from Matt. Matt, thank you for the questions. So this is really interesting. I, I, I uh, <laughs> And you may not be able to comment on this because historically speaking, I don't think I've really seen any microcap biotechs buy back their own stock. Yeah. What are your thoughts on a buyback? Um, and then the second question is, what type of partnership opportunities do you see after phase two results, if successful? Right. So the first one is, is relatively easy and it may, it may sound you know, uh, like a knee-jerk reaction, but we actually discuss this almost every board meeting at Collab just in half of the several years. We come to the same conclusion over and over. Um, biotech companies, biopharma companies do not buy back their stock. <laughs> you would be the first, that's yeah. be unprecedented. You know, and, and the reason you don't is because capital is precious and it is absolutely unpredictable as to when it will be available and at what price. So you never use your current precious capital to do anything other than advance your corporate development and generate value creating data. So we talk about it all the time, but we can never find a reason why it would make more sense to spend money buying back our stock than anything else. We also don't think we could buy back enough to, to make a sustaining difference in the stock price. Well, I was going to say, David, this is just you and me as friends yeah. here. Just because you announce a buyback doesn't mean that you actually buy any stock. Yeah. So there's been many instances where guys are like, we're going to do a $50 million buyback. And three years later, you notice that they bought $75,000 worth of stock <laughs> and they don't mention it anymore. I think it's more of kind of an optical thing where yeah. it's like, hey guys, we understand that the company is undervalued and we're kind of putting our own money or in this case, some of the some of the money in treasury. But I totally get your point. And that's why you don't, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen it in my career. There's a corollary to that question, which I'll go ahead and ask anyway, which is, you know, is management buying, and, you know, and why doesn't management buy if you're so undervalued? Well, you know, and again, the answer is pretty straightforward. We're constantly in possession of material non-public information, constantly. Right? We're always looking at companies, assets to buy. We're entertaining partnership discussions. We're looking at capital raises. We're, we're seeing data on the fly, all this kind of thing. We just simply can't be buying on the open market um, regularly. But every one of us participates to the maximum in our employee stock purchase plan. So we're buying in the background. And twice a year, the Form 4s or Form 3s come out and show that we have you know, consumed that. But even there, as executive officers, the, the SEC and IRS caps us on how much we can benefit from those programs as well. Understood. And then, and then in terms of partnerships, I know given your background, yep. you know, de-risk situations, I know that you're not just sitting idle. I mean, what's kind of your stance? Are, are these people that you've already had discussions with? What's yep. your philosophy on? Partners? So in the case of Honedra, we have, I would, I, I'll, I'll even be specific, three companies, two of which are are large pharma companies. One is a Japan-based company. The other is a, uh, uh, a European-based company. And then a, a, what I'll call a Japanese a mid-sized pharma company. Those three have you know, essentially completed their technical diligence and have told us that you just got to finish enrollment. And, you know, and, and then when we see the data, we're ready to pull the trigger. And so far, because it's an open label study, you know, everybody can see that the data is moving in the right direction and we're likely to, to have a positive outcome. So, so we're very comfortable about that one. It's just a question of getting this trial finished. Um, for Freedom, we've had you know, discussions with all of the typical folks that you would imagine who are interested in the cardiovascular space, big pharma, big biotech, uh, and they're waiting to see the data from the Freedom trial. So you know, I think that based upon positive data at Freedom, there's a pretty good chance that, that phase three will be done by somebody else or done in concert with somebody else just because um, that's the, the indications that we're getting. And then finally, where can people find more information about the company? Where's the best place to go? Best place is www.caladrius.com. Uh, you can also find references you know, and links to us from the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology websites. 
uh, and we have Twitter feeds, Facebook feeds. I don't do that stuff. All of our, our, our very astute millennials take care of that, but, uh, but we're easy to find out about. And of course, you saw on the last slide, our head of communications, John Mendito, and, and his able associate, Lauren Lurick, are, are also, Lulick are also available you know, to receive emails. There's a corporate email um, web box uh, address. You can get in touch with us very easily. And I, I, you know, I would be doing a great disservice if I didn't give a huge kudos to, to Lauren and, and John. They are exemplary from start to finish. You should be very proud of, of, of your team members. Um, I but, am and, and very fortunate to have them. So, so my final question, this is why I do this. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, it's probably going to be slightly inappropriate. What do you think the over and under is in terms of months that you and I will see each other again? In person. In person. I, I'm going to bet, and I'm not a betting person, which is an odd I'm thing for a biotech CEO to say. My wife <laughs> all knows too well that I'm not a betting person, given but, all the losses that I've had. Right. But I would, I, would, I, I, would, I would place a bet that you and I will see each other live at the upcoming LD Micro Conference at the end of the year. That's awesome, man. Yeah, no, look, I, my, again, my stance is, Common sense goes a long way right. and it's going to be here. I, I don't see it going away anytime soon, but as you know, SARS and MERS are still in circulation. Right. So, so look, it's David, it is always a pleasure. Um, thank you again for your time. And again, for anyone who just submitted a question by way of email or by Q and A, if I didn't get to it, I'm sorry, I will get to it. We'll forward it to John. David, for now, I look forward to seeing you and hopefully this year in person. Um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, how can I put this eloquently? I think that your hard work is ultimately going to pay off in the end. I appreciate it, Chris. Thank Thanks you. for the time today and everyone be well. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Cheers.